When we talk about sex segregation, we feel it's something left back in the 1970s. If anyone publicly supported that men belong to the public sphere, women at home, they would be criticized as regressive and conservative. Is, however, sex segregation something our civilized world has outgrown? In the end, it depends on how you perceive the world. The separation of the two sexes is something that is still practiced in the Philippines even today. Yet, such examples, you'll say, feel so far away from us that it's as if they take place in another universe. In Europe, or in the USA, and even in Greece, this is a non-issue. What about gentlemen's clubs, fraternities and sororities, single-sex schools, or the more culture-specific Caffeinia and Barberica? Nobody can deny that, at least in our part of the world, we've come a long way since the 1970s. Yet we can also deny that sex segregation is still happening in our days. You're probably wondering, why would sex-exclusive places be such a big deal? For every fraternity, there is a sorority. For every boys-only school, there is a girls-only school. For every barberico, there is a hairdresser's, although these are not strictly exclusive of men. Isn't this a sign of gender equality? There is nothing wrong with women and men wanting to meet in separate places. What is wrong is when these separate places translate into different access to opportunities. In his article, David S. Cohen argues how sex segregation in education may lead to better occupational chances for men than for women. Quote, Boys learned from teachers with greater knowledge bases in the subjects they taught. Boys had access to almost twice as many books in their library. Boys had opportunities to take a wider range of courses and boys had an alumni network that was much more extensive, accomplished and active in networking with the students." Unquote. Even something innocently looking as a men's only golf club can strip women of possible job-related advantages. A large part of networking in American business world takes place in such clubs. Sex segregation, Daphne Spain argues, excludes women from partaking in the transfer of socially valuable knowledge. As long as there is sex segregation and men-only places are the sites where this knowledge is concentrated, women's place will be inferior to men's. However, it's not just an issue of the practical distribution of knowledge. Space is not innocent. It can shape attitudes and foster prejudice. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? How can something external, like space, influence something internal, like our perception? According to Shirley Ardener, space segregation reflects social segregation. And yet, it functions more than just a mirror. It helps perpetuate these hierarchies through the spatial limitation of the people who occupy it. It is not accidental for Daphne Spain that the societies with higher sex segregation diachronically and cross-culturally are usually the ones with a greater gap between the two gender social status. Basic psychological processes are at play here, namely that of team belonging. Michael Kimmel identifies three important ones. 1. Those who are outside are different from those inside the group. 2. Those who constitute the group are superior to the outsiders. 3. As a group, there is a common mentality that assigns it coherence. Any individual deviations in attitudes may be suppressed for the sake of unity. Where there is sex segregation, a separation between man and woman, there is the unconscious message that these two entities are two different groups. In a group of men, the psychological need to feel superior to the outsiders of the group translates into disparaging prejudice against women. Cohen cites a study which suggests that sexist jokes or the sexual objectification of women occurs more often when women are not present. In male-only schools, boys are supposed to be taught with different material so as to become appropriately masculine. Even if individual members of the male group feel differently, they will hesitate to stand up to the prevalent opinion in fear of disrupting the group's coherence. 
where lines are drawn between men and women, the greater their distance gets, and the more they view each other as the other, either a savage one. How often do girls say that boys are like cavemen, or an exoticized one? How many men believe that women are there to satisfy our sex drives? Spaces are not just places, the material, tangible environment, the background setting of action. They have an invisible, immaterial aspect as well. They constitute the expression of a particular set of social relations. The more attuned we become to this, the more likely it is to change such possible problematic relations and redefine pre-existing places. society is promoted as the model of advanced civilization, a refined culture that has overcome social discriminations, which is mostly true. A socially inclusive society is defined as one where all people feel valued, their differences are respected and their basic needs are met so they can live in dignity. Is it though safe to say that these principles are represented in everyday life, when spaces where people feel excluded based solely in their sex still exist? As our survey indicates, the special features of its sex make people feel as if they have more rights in certain spaces. In some cases, this may even lead to the point of feeling they have the right to exclude the other sex. As remarked by James Twitchell, a generation ago, exclusion on the basis of sex was the norm. In many cases today, the expression of such ideas may arch some eyebrows or even trigger passionate confrontations depending on the environment they will be expressed in. The truth is that there are clearly places traditionally thought of as women's or men's territory, either inside the house or outside. Thus, as Twitchell explains, understanding the sex of space might help us understand the often paradoxical and even testy uses of territory as a way of marking off personal boundaries, edges of the self. Like other animals, we are territorial and we squabble when invaded. As evidenced by the results from our survey, there are clearly people who feel more in control when in certain spaces. However, it was interesting enough to find out that almost half of the respondents replied with other when they were asked about the spaces inside the house in which they felt more dominant, assuming they chose this answer because they felt that there are no spaces which can be related with certain qualities of their gender. This can be an encouraging indication that there is a shift in mentality. Still, a considerable amount of people were able to identify certain domestic spaces as the place in which their domination is secured, or at least they feel self-assured. For both men and women, their first choice was the bedroom, with 17% and 18% respectively. Women's second favorite choice was the kitchen, no surprises there, with 16%, and men's was the living room with 17%. Keeping in mind the predominant norms or gender roles, their preferences are hardly surprising. Even so, taking a closer look to the percentage of these preferences, age of the respondents, mostly between 16 and 25, and the fact that most of them live in urban areas, we can obtain a good grasp of the pace in which gender mentality is changing and its direction. Only a few decades ago, the acceptable places for a respectable woman in Western society were the domestic space, the hair salon and social functions or events while being escorted by a man guardian. In other words, women were expected to be found in places interwoven with the purpose, providing for others or spending their time making themselves attractive. Features that could be celebrated as part of feminine nature end up being the very things that limit them in two-dimensional figures. While their position has been substantially improved since then and we are now able to talk about gender equality without it sounding like wishful thinking for every woman that tends to step outside the prescribed societal stereotypes of feminine fulfillment, there is a narrow-minded individual pointing out her overreaching attitude. Such incidents occur on a daily basis. From attending or participating in sports events to excelling in the field of science or simply committing themselves to a pursuit of a career, women seem to be held accountable for those choices as if they disrupt some kind of natural order. On the other hand, let us not portray men as facial tyrants, but rather contemplate upon the fact that both sexes face challenges regarding gender realization and the expectations they have to meet as a result of their sex. Men also face social criticism when they tend to wander 
away from the socially constructed idea of manhood. Their setbacks have more to do with the qualities they have to impersonate, being dominant, composed and adventurous. Someone who prefers to take up the role of stay-at-home dad is viewed suspiciously. Men that enter seemingly female-dominated workplaces deal with the same anxiety, providing their worth just as women would in male-dominated areas. However encouraging may have been the results from the question about space dominance, they lose in significance when the amount of people who have faced problems or difficulties because of their gender is too high, 59%. It is disheartening to realize that the world we have built for ourselves ends up being oppressive instead of nourishing. Who else is there to blame about that fact but us? To be more specific, 59% of women and 58% of men have had to fend for themselves and or felt uncomfortable, unwanted and embarrassed because of their sex. This saddening fact goes to support that though we tend, not always so unfairly, to blame that male-dominant society, men are as confined in gender norms and stereotypes as women. Both sexes have almost equally come face to face with discrimination because of their gender and in the end no one seems to have the upper hand. In general terms, what is clear is that spatial control, whether enforced through the power of convention or symbolism or through the straightforward threat of violence, can be a fundamental element in the constitution of gender in its highly varied forms. Both genders are limited by the boundaries created in their own society and the fact that this has emerged by their own doings and way of thinking is as saddening as is hopeful. If the problem is recognized, then the only things that remain to change is the way people themselves choose to handle it. space is defined as the part of an urban environment which is open, accessible and available to all members of a particular community. By definition then, urban public spaces are meant to serve the needs of all members of the particular community without disregarding the needs of any individual or social group. However, society's deeply rooted sexist and heteronormative perceptions have affected the design and architecture of urban environments. As a result, public places eventually fail to fulfill their purpose as they fail to meet even basic needs of individuals and groups on the basis of their gender. Historically, public space has been considered men's territory, while women's territory has been restricted to the private space. As a result, public space often disregards specific needs of women. Public breastfeeding is approached differently in each country or jurisdiction. It is either not specifically mentioned by law, or it is explicitly mentioned and it's either legally protected or forbidden. However, the oversexualization of the female body still triggers negative reactions to public breastfeeding, even in places where it is legally permitted. In fact, as Johnston Charopleto et al. explained, the oversexualization of the female body is so deeply rooted in our culture that women end up internalizing the sexual objectification of their own bodies, developing themselves a negative attitude towards breastfeeding. In Greece, there is no provision by the law or urban design for women who carry their babies in public spaces. As a result, women with babies are either excluded from public places or they are forced to face public discomfort, sexism or harassment. On the other hand, the design of public restrooms disregards specific biological differences between women and men that do matter in the name of an ill-perceived view of equality. For instance, women usually need more time in the restroom, resulting in long queues outside women's restrooms while men's restrooms are usually unoccupied. Thus, an equal number of women's and men's restrooms fails to equally serve women's and men's needs. Public restrooms perpetuate the division of social roles that are assigned to each gender in the context of the patriarchic model. For instance, diaper changing tables, if they are provided at all, are usually placed inside a women's section, perpetuating the stereotype that a child's care is only a woman's responsibility and excluding men who are caring for babies. In the vast majority, public restrooms are segregated on the basis of biological sex 
and designed in the context of the heteronormative model. According to this model, gender is a binary system divided strictly into the categories feminine and masculine, and social gender is expected to match biological sex. In reality, gender is rather a continuum and there are many people who do not identify with either of the two fixed genders or whose social gender does not match their biological sex. As a result, transgender and other gender variant people are either forced to abstain from public restrooms or to face harassment, a ridicule or even risk their own safety. According to Olga Gersonson's research article, in 2001, a student group in the University of Massachusetts, called Restroom Revolution, initiated a campaign in favor of unisex and transgender-friendly restrooms. Gradually, more and more cities and universities in the U.S. adopt unisex restrooms, while in Greece there is no such provision by law and regulations. However, unisex restrooms raise some new challenges and risks. An extra set of restrooms dedicated to the non-heteronormative people will still stigmatize them as the other. The issue of women's safety in the case of unisex restrooms is also raised. However, both of these challenges and risks are themselves a result of sexism. Consequently, our attempts towards a truly useful and functional urban environment for all community members should be accompanied and supported by a shift in the community members' own mentality. Apart from certain people not enjoying the feeling of belonging at certain places, as mentioned before, remains for many the feeling of fear, fear of being in public spaces. There are numerous such spaces that are not safe for women or effeminate men who are usually advised to never walk all alone or be out late at night. The thing is, they fear not being mugged, be hit by a car or anything similar. They fear sexual abuse or violence because of their gender expression, in that case, femininity. It seems like being a woman or being feminine equals being in danger all the time. There is this broader perception for women that they exist to please other people by smiling, being kind and caring, beautiful and sexually pleasing when the latter want it. Women are not advertised usually for having strong opinions when it comes to disagreeing with men. They are advertised as flirtatious, pretty people who like being in a relationship and taking care of their man's needs. This leads to problems, as is the development of a rape country. Rape culture relates to the notion that women are sexually objectified by men who think that it is women's responsibility to please them physically and respond to their wolf-whistling, cat-calling, sexual suggestions. So cat-calling on the street is an example of rape culture. A man killing women because they denied him the right to have sex with him is a sign of rape culture. People telling women who wear revealing clothes that they want to be raped is a sign of rape culture. Rape culture does not let women feel safe at any place, for they have to worry not to do or say anything provoking. They have to worry for how they are making men back off when they do not want to be around them, and they have to worry about not being harassed on the street for the way they are dressed, or just walking down the street being themselves. Rape culture is not a misunderstood ideology. It does not deny that men are raped as well, but it merely describes how overly sexualized women's bodies are and how this ideology is rooted deeply in our societies and minds. We have all these places that women are especially afraid to frequent alone, like bathrooms, clubs, buses at night, taxis at night, the streets at night, university campuses at night, and night itself. This was a profound conclusion of the questionnaire of this project, as most of the women who filled it in said they do not feel comfortable being on the streets, especially at night. They are afraid that they might be assaulted and that nobody will save them or spare them or acknowledge they actually said no. But violence is not only rape, but also lighter assaults like touching when consent is not given, or the violence of saying inappropriate things without asking for consent, or the violence of staring at someone like they are a piece of property. There is violence in all these types of behavior which causes fear to women everywhere. 
Unfortunately, that is not a thing of the past. It is just sometimes so subtle or explained as a natural male behavior that it is or tries to be excused, and women are encouraged to do things to protect themselves from violence, but men are rarely told not to be violent. In the official website of the Greek police force, there are tips for the safety of women, elderly people, and violence in the family. There are no tips for the safety of men, because usually men are or are supposed to be safe and save also others. Apart from public spaces at night, women are discouraged from being alone with men at daytime in case the man is a pervert, because the excuse of the pervert is a very comforting excuse for society. Perverts are few, so the problem is not supposed to be social, but remains with those few. So, for example, taxis and elevators are always a little dangerous for women, or even bathrooms, even though they are highly gendered. Women are afraid to go there alone, in case someone tries to assault them. Taxi drivers, who are usually men, are said to be sexist and perverted people who might harm women, especially young women who go out at night and return at home drunk or dressed in a certain way. Buses are like the street at night. Nobody knows when the wrong pervert will be at the wrong place and what the pervert might do, or try to do, or promise to do to a woman he chooses. No solo going at home at night is advised for women. Not that another woman will be a protection, but men, they surely do. This is why mothers always advise their daughters to go out with mixed groups of friends, not only with girlfriends. Rape culture makes itself present in the weirdest places, like gyms, university campuses, workplaces. It is not rare for women to be victims of assaults in any of these places, which are supposed to be equally accessible and available for all genders, but apparently women are the ones who have to be careful so that nothing happens to them. It is an eternal struggle to fit and feel safe. As a conclusion, our project's questionnaire, or in other words, our survey, showed that it is mostly young women that feel they are not safe in the streets, or they should behave in a specific way so as not to make their presence overly known for the eyes or ears of the opposite sex. The questionnaire used the binary man-woman in that question and thus the expression opposite sex. Also, judging by their answers, younger people are more cautious about gender and space, so one could start reflecting on the correlation between sexuality and age as factors of social status. Young people, who are usually the most sexually interesting people, are the ones who are more cautious, whereas older people are less cautious about public spaces and behavior, as if they were less important and less likely to be in the center of attention. After completing the survey, we had results we did not expect having, as for example a high number of women saying they believe there should be places for one gender only, an answer that could be interpreted in more than one ways, but we certainly were not expecting it. Despite every surprise though, our overall impression about safety in urban spaces is that public, open-air space is perceived as dangerous for most women, but not for most men, and this rings many bells about social structure and noise.